Matthew 24, please, um, if you have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in front of you. Page numbers will be on the screen. We're looking at uh, the end times through the cross. Uh, Lynn is a journey to the cross and the empty tomb, and um, we've been journeying through Matthew for a little bit of time here. And um, so we're going to read the, the, the rest of chapter 24 and just see what it might want to say to us today. Uh, if you get there, if you don't mind standing as we read God's word together, if you can't, I totally understand. But if you're able and don't mind, um, we'll stand together. Matthew 24, we'll start reading verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but only the Father. He's talking about when Jesus will come back again. Verse 37, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. So when he returns, truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that a servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away for a long time. And then he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour when he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him to a place with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Next slide. This is the word of God for the people of God. And you said, thanks be to God. You may be seated this morning. Uh, Let's pray one more time. God, um, help us. Lord, we're going to need you uh, to get the inside out of this that we need. We're going to need you to open our hearts. And um, I believe this this passage points to something that is so integral in the life of the church, something so important. Not because I say it, but because you did. And um, so we're going to need you, God, to help us over these next few moments that we get to spend together. And, And nobody needs you now more than me. So, God, may the, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, in 1972, a movie came out called A Thief in the Night. Anybody ever see A Thief in the Night? Uh, this is the opening scene in A Thief in the Night. Watch this. <laughs> keep coming in from all over the globe, confirming it as true. To say that the world is in a state of shock this morning would be to understate the situation. The event seems to have taken place at the same time all over the world, just about 25 minutes ago. Suddenly and without warning, literally thousands, perhaps millions of people just disappeared. Do eyewitness accounts of these disappearances have not been clear, but one thing is certainly sure. Millions who were living on this earth last night are not here this morning. Speculation is running high that some alien force from outside our system has declared war on the planet, and some feel it to be a spectacular judgment of God. Even if it is something like the rapture, we need not panic. The very fact that we are here and able to discuss it is sign enough that it is not all inclusive. End of quotation. The event spoken of in the Hebrew Christian.
Christian scriptures is described somewhat in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 24, verses 36 and on. And Jesus Christ is reported to be the speaker. And he says, and I quote, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. <laughs> so we, they would show this movie. It's about two hours long. And then they would open the altar. And everybody was like, I'm going. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just got to make sure. Um, I, underneath the, the title of this, this clip on YouTube, <laughs> this was the subtitle is what it called it, A Christian Fear Flick. I thought that was funny. Nobody else does. Um, and, and, and this is one of those, like, it was meant to literally scare the hell out of you, right? Like, out, get the hell out, get Jesus in. I mean, it was one of these films that, that and, and if you watch the rest of it, I mean, this it's just unbelievable. And, and then they have, like, guillotines, and they're cup chopping people's heads off. And it's like, ah, I don't want that. And so it's, it's this whole movie based on fear fear of trying to get people to say, I don't want that to happen to me. Now, I think that that, that can be okay. I, I, I think that there may be a little bit of good in that, but I'm not sure. Now, just follow me that that's what this is trying to get us to do. I'm not sure that Jesus is trying to get us to be afraid. He's much more trying to warn us about how we should live here and now. He's not trying to get us to be afraid. He's just saying, this is what it looks like. And if you do this, so what is he calling us to do? Oh, oh, so out of this movie, go to the next slide. This song came, and I, I thought about getting my guitar and playing it, but we're not going to do that. And, and passing out lighters that you could wave in the air as we sang the song, or, or your cell phone is the new thing, right? But this is, this is the words that came from this movie. Life was filled with guns and war, and all of us got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Next slide. Children died, and the days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. And then the, the chorus, there's no time to change your mind. The sun has come, and you've been left behind. Uh, next slide. Uh, a man and wife asleep in bed. She hears the noise and turns her head. He's gone. I wish we'd all been ready. Uh, two men walking up a hill. One disappears and one left standing still. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come, and you, let's just stop with that one. And so you get the picture, and, and it was this. It was funny. It's this really slow, kind of folksy song, but, but the title, once again, was This Was the Beginning of Christian Rock Music. <laughs> How naive we were. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, my goodness. Okay, so, so let's, let's figure out what Jesus is trying to say, what this looks like for us, and what this is calling us to do. So uh, the first part of it talks about a guy named Noah, and that in Noah's time, Noah was building an ark, and the people had no idea why he was building an ark or what was going on. So they just continued to eat, drink, and be merry and get married and do all the things they were doing. And, um, and Noah tried to warn them, but they just kept living the life the way that they thought they should live it. And, uh, and, 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 and then uh, Noah got all the animals and, and then he got his family on the boat and it started raining. You're like, oh, this is strange, strange. Um, and then it kept raining and kept raining for 40 days. I mean, it kept raining, kept raining, kept raining. And then... They wish they would have listened. <laughs> they wish they would have been on the boat um, because uh, it wasn't a good situation. And so, um, so Jesus says that's what it's going to be like, that there's going to be people who are just living life the way they want to. Man, they're having a good old time. Uh, and, 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 and they're not going to heed the warning, and, but they're going to wish that they had listened to what God was trying to say to them. Uh, this guy named Stanley Hauerwas has this quote, says this, disciples like Noah, uh, that would be us, are, are to build an ark even if it is not raining. Can you imagine that? Build an ark even if it's not raining. The name given to that ark is the church. The builders of the church will be surrounded by many who go about their lives eating, drinking, and marrying, and living as if nothing has changed, even though Noah has built an ark. But the floods will all will come, drowning all. And so this passage, Jesus is saying, hey, it's just like Noah. He built a boat, and it, and it hadn't even started raining yet. And so he was trying to tell the people, but you, you still build the boat because you have no idea when it's going to happen. You don't know the hour when this is going to take place. Okay, now it's kind of like um, the carpet cleaning guy or the plumber. Sorry, I hope I'm not offending anybody. Or the maintenance guy. And they call you and say, all right, we'll be there between 8 and Until Jesus comes back. Sometime between that time. Between 8 and Jesus coming back. We'll get there to do whatever we're supposed to do. 
Uh, can you be a little more specific than that, please? Um, sometimes it's even longer than the four-hour timeline or whatever it would be. Um, y- y- and you're like, what? So what do you do? Uh, you get dressed at 8 o'clock in the morning because they might show up at 8.05. Sometimes they even show up early because, they, you know, your timetable really has no bearing on what they're going to do. Um, so you get dressed. You make sure the house is ready at 8 so that you can be ready when the guy gets there. Uh, my wife is in Nashville, Tennessee right now. And, um, and so when Tara goes on a trip by herself, which she doesn't do often, which is a good thing, um, but sometimes if she goes to Michigan or she goes with the boys, um, there's one question that happens, and I've asked it a million times. When are you going to be home? And why do I ask when are you going to be home? Because the saying is true. Sometimes when the cat's away, the mice will play, right? And, and so I need to know specifically when she's going to be back so that the floor can get swept and the dishes can get done and um, the bed can get made and the house can get put back in order. And so okay, I, 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 Friday, Friday. She was leaving. Hey, when do you think you're going to be home Sunday? I need to know. Are you going to come home Monday? Yesterday. Hey, do you, wait, are you coming home tomorrow? I need to know when, you, when you're going to be here. I need to know a specific time when you're going to be here. Uh, right after this, I'm going to call her and be like, have you left yet? I need to know what time because it gives me a point of reference to know when everything has to be done, right? And if I didn't know, I would be in trouble. And um, I mean, the house isn't trash. Do you know what I'm saying? But it, it she has a certain way that she likes it, and, and, and I just love her so much that I just want to do everything to please her. And, um, and so, I, we gotta, we, so the boys and I this afternoon will be making sure the house is ready to go. People want to have this understanding of when Jesus is going to return so they can try to get their stuff together. And Jesus says, sorry, you don't know We want to be able to pick up the house and dust off the shelves and get the dishes done and sweep the floor. So we we try to figure out exactly when he's coming back so that we can do that. And Jesus says, just stop trying. Because guess what? I don't even know. I don't even know. I can't even give you a hint. Only So uh, maybe you've been in this situation where uh, you planned a, a, a gathering with somebody and they're going to come to your house to eat dinner or something and you forgot. You ever been there? And uh, the doorbell rings and the house is like not put together like it was supposed to be. And you're like, give us just a second. You know what I'm saying? Like stand out in the cold. Why are we fix our house up really quick? And we shuffle things around really quick. Here's the thing. You can do that with your house, but not with your life. But that's what we want to do is I'm going to just live as close as I can to the edge. And, and one day I'll get it all together. And we can't do it with our life. Our life is heading a certain direction. And we have no idea when he's going to come back. And so what do we do? What do we do? And so Jesus uh, goes on from verse 42 to 51 to say it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like uh, you got to keep watch. And if you knew when the burglar was going to come, you would sit there with the club or the gun or whatever and make sure that he wasn't. Or it's kind of like two slaves who, who, who one did what the master thought he was supposed to do to feed the people and, and to feed the workers. And the other thought, you know what? The master hasn't been here in forever. I'm just going to go do what I want to do. And when the master comes back, he sees that one has not done and live the way that the master had asked and the other has. And so he takes the one who hasn't and says literally rips him into pieces and <laughs> puts him with the hypocrites and um, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what is Jesus trying to tell us? What is Jesus saying? What is this passage really about? Will he come back again? Yes, but I think Jesus is trying to help us out about what it means to be his disciple and what it means to live for him. He's calling his people to consistent living living, to have disciplines, to have things that are a part that help you become the people that God wants you to be. Uh, One guy said it like this, what the disciples do know is that the end could come at any time. This knowledge should spur active engagement in their assigned mission. What we do know, however, is what we are supposed to be doing in the meantime. We have no idea when he's coming, but we know he is coming. And so that shouldn't be like, well, we can wait around, we can do this. It should spur us to be actively engaged in who he's called us to be right here and right now. Now, a little while ago, and maybe still today, uh, go to the next picture, there was this bumper sticker. Jesus is coming, look busy. 
Jesus, come and look busy. Um, I, I think it may be more than just looking busy. It's doing things that that will help me to be like Jesus. Uh, it kind of reminds me of sports teams, and uh, maybe some of you played sports, and maybe some of you didn't, but I think that the analogy will still stick for you. Um, so I, I've talked about this before, but uh, uh, a few years ago now, when I was living in Mount Vernon, my mom bought me and my brothers a week-long pass to the Memorial Golf Tournament in Columbus, Ohio. And um, so we went every day to the practice rounds, to the, the par three competition, to all the rounds of the tournament, and it was so much fun. One day we were at the practice rounds, and we went to the practice putting tee where all the golfers were, and, and there's this golfer named KJ Choi, and I don't know why we did this, but we literally stood there and watched him putt the same putt over a hundred times. He had little tees in the thing that, that, that fit around his golf, his putter, and, and he literally, boom, boom, same thing over a hundred, and we just sat there and watched him. We were like, this is amazing. Why? Because there's going to come a point when the putt matters. <laughs> and he doesn't want to have to think about it. He just wants to be able to step up and do it. It's why a basketball player shoots 100 or so free throws after every practice, sometimes 500, sometimes 1,000. Because when the game's on the line, they just want to be able to step up there and do it. It, uh, I get to watch, sometimes I get to watch Matt coach. I didn't even ask him if I could, but sometimes I go over there and I watch him play baseball in the gym. And, 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 and it's funny because sometimes they do the same thing every day. And you think the kids might think, what is going on? But he's teaching them what he wants them to do in certain situations so that when they get in those situations, they know what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to to act. Um, I went to the church this week of Vince Lombardi. Anybody ever heard of Vince Lombardi? Um, he's a famous football coach, and um, he's got all these famous sayings. And, uh, and so I, I, he's got this one saying that's really famous, that at the beginning of every football season with the Green Bay Packers, um, he's so infamous that the, the, the Super Bowl trophy is named after him. It's called the Lombardi Trophy. That's how good he was. And, uh, but he, he's got this famous saying that at the beginning of every football season, before they put on pads, before they did anything, that he would hold up a football and he would say, gentlemen, this is a football. Why? Because he wanted them to remember what they were even there to do. You're not here to make money. You're here to play football. This is a football. Well, then I found this clip from Vince Lombardi, and we're going to watch it together. This, oh, my goodness. Are you ready to go to church? Watch this. This is unbelievable. <laughs> One play can win a football game. One game can make a season. And one player, any player, may make or break a play, a game, a season. There are approximately 150 plays in a football game. And there are only three or four plays in any game which make the difference between winning and losing. No one knows when the big play is coming up. Therefore, every player must go all out on every play. In other words, every player has a responsibility on every play. And that responsibility begins with the proper use of his given talent. The development of all talent is founded on fundamentals. And in football, the first of the fundamentals is the basic football position. Woo, preach it, Vince. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a couple of plays in every game. What, two or three plays that's going to determine who wins. But you don't know when it's coming. So what you need to do is play all out for every play because you don't know when the play, and you might be an integral part of making that play. If you're just waiting around saying, is it this play or is it this play, you might think, oh, but you play all out 120% for every play because you don't know when the play may be coming. Uh, maybe basketball fans, let's switch modes a little from, from um, there's this guy named Stephen Curry. Anybody ever heard of Stephen Curry? He um, is being proclaimed the best shooter ever in basketball, ever. This guy is so smooth. He's like butter. You know what I'm saying? Like he is just, he has got the shot. He, he knows what he's doing. And, um, and, 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 and so it's just this understanding of he's just, he's, he's so good. Well, last night, the, 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 the Golden State Warriors were playing the Oklahoma City Thunder. They went into overtime. Game was tied. 
uh, the game is tied at the end of overtime with like three seconds left. Three seconds left. And, uh, and so it's kind of panic mode, and usually the coach calls a timeout, uh, but he didn't at this time. And so they run down the court, and um, I want you to see where Steph Curry shoots the ball from. R roll this clip. This is exciting. They do have a timeout. Decide not to use it. Curry, way downtown. Bang! Bang! Oh, what a shot from Curry! With six-tenths of a second remaining. Getting a little groovy. Look at that. Look at that guy. That's what I'm going to do when I preach, get a little groovy the up here. The of Stephen Curry continues. And he ties the NBA record with his 12th three-pointer of the game. 12th three-pointer of the game. Shoots it from half court like it's nothing. Do you know how he can do this? This is what he does in practice before every game. Look where he is. Half court. Before the game, every game. Look at this. It's like it's nothing. He's going to shoot this, and he drains it like it's nothing. Now, does Steph Curry, Curry go out every play and shoot from half court? That's silly. But he might have to, right? There may become a point that he has to shoot the ball from half court, and so what does he do before every game? Is he goes to half court, and he shoots the ball to get ready in case that moment you getting the point? <laughs> what Jesus is trying to say, uh, Vince Lombardi says this, winning is not a sometime thing, it's an all the time thing. You don't do things right once in a while, you do them right all the time. <gasps> Vince Lombardi, I got a few more. This is just so good. I was just reading, I was like, preach it, dude, preach it. He says this, in order to succeed, this group, I think this can talk about the church, this group will need a singleness of purpose. They will need a dedication, and they will have to convince all other prospects of the willingness to sacrifice. And the difference between a successful person and others, listen to this, is not a lack of strength, not a lack of knowledge, but a lack of will. So being a Christian is not about knowing all the right answers. It's not about being the strongest are you determined that no matter what may come, I'm going to live for Jesus with everything that I am, every second of every day? Success demands singleness of purpose. Vince Lombardi. Preach, guys. Vince Lombardi. If we're going to be who God's called us to be, it's not because we're afraid that we're going to miss something. If we are living and being and breathing every second of every day, I'm going to be who God's called me to be because I never know when the moment may come that when Jesus would come back or I get a moment to speak for him or I get a moment to make a difference in somebody's life. The only way to live with a sense of ease and joy and happiness is living every second of every day for him and him alone. That's what this is about. You don't know when it's going to happen. So just be who I've called you to be. And when it happens and the master comes back, you're going to be like, sweet. Because you're ready. You're ready. And ready isn't getting, oh, we've got to get the house together. Ready is, I'm going to wake up tomorrow. I'm going to be who Jesus Christ has called me to be. I believe that I will be successful in who he's called me to be if I allow him to transform my life. Because who knows, as Pastor Suman said, what life's going to bring. The only way to get ready for his coming or for what may come is to live every second of every day for him and him alone. A few quotes and we'll be done. Uh, Thomas Long will be on the screen. In the face of the crushing needs of the world, <laughs> the only way to preserve hope, the only way to maintain a willing sense of discipleship is to trust that in any moment we may be surprised by the sudden presence of God. As we journey down the long and seemingly endless path of discipleship, we never know when we may encounter the living God waiting for us around the next bend. Indeed, each unexpected meeting, each moment of holy surprise is but an anticipation of the great climax of all human history and longing when the world seemingly spinning along in ceaseless tedium will find itself gathered into the extravagant mercy 
And then uh, he, he talks a little bit. Thomas Long goes on. It's not going to be on the screen. Talks a little bit about. It's funny how um, the 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 it, it's troubling maybe. And the trouble begins for the slave when he thinks and he thinks, you know what, my master's been gone for a long time. I can go do whatever I want. Only for the master to come back and find things not the way they should be. This guy named Eugene Boring, this part's not on the slide, it says that throughout church history there have always been groups, this is, this is big, that convinced they knew when the world would end would quit their jobs and wait with eager anticipation for Christ's appearance. Next slide. And Matthew's understanding of Christian faith, the second coming, listen to this, doesn't cause us to quit the job of being the church in the world. Rather, it calls us to take it up with even more urgency. There have been people who are like, we know when Jesus comes, let's quit our jobs, let's go in the mountains and let's wait for it. And this is saying, keep doing what you're doing but do it more fully than you've ever done it before because you have no idea when the end is near. And so Jesus isn't saying, just stop everything you're doing. He's saying, no, engage everything you're doing more fully because it should push you to want to be more like him. Um, and I got a lot of quotes this morning. Uh, next slide. Uh, when the church, this is good. This is why we sang that song this morning again and again, and we're going to sing it again, again, and again, and again. When the church stops expecting God, listen to this, and begins only to expect church, this inevitably breeds discouragement, conflict, and a slackening of mission. When the church no longer anticipates God at any minute, when the church no longer expects to have its work validated by the advent of the kingdom, then it ceases to be a kingdom community and becomes a self-contained institution living only for today and competing within itself for power and status. When the church no longer saves a place at the table for the coming Messiah, then it ceases to feed others and simply begins to gorge itself. We have to live with this anticipation that God could come at any moment, but it doesn't cause us to be afraid and it doesn't cause us to, to run and hide. It causes us to say, man, he could come at any moment. I want him to find me being faithful to do the things that I do. And just like a baseball player hits off the tee a million times and a golfer putts, and he's calling us to allow things to so shape our life that causes us to be more and more and more like him. That's why we should read our Bible. Not because we have to, but it's a discipline that causes us to understand more of who he wants us to be. That's why we should have lives of prayer, not because we have to pray, and I can check it off a list. I want to be found faithful to know who he wants me to be and who he's calling me to be. Last one, I promise. Only those who remain faithful in their living and obedient to their commission will be unembarrassed <laughs> by his sudden coming. Again, the fact of that coming, not the time of it, is to be the foremost in the minds of the disciples. The knowledge of that fact must govern the lives of the disciples in whatever time they find themselves. People have tried to, to do all this calculation in the book of Daniel and Revelation and tried to pinpoint the day and the hour and, and actually found a website that, that has a clock that's counting down to a day in, in 2028. So we got some time, but uh, 2028, that's the day. Um, September 21st, Mike and I looked at it this week, and um, 2028, and it's got counting down seconds, seconds. And it's like, I'm not the brightest, you know what I mean, not the sharpest pencil, but I think it says you don't know. <laughs> don't. So quit trying to figure it out and live for the kingdom. And then when he comes back, you can be like, sweet. Let's celebrate. Because I was doing my best to humbly do what I felt like Jesus was calling me to do. It's the basketball player. He's shooting half-court shots. Not every game you shoot a half-court shot, but you never know when you may need to. So I read and I study and maybe I listen to sermons and, and I do all the things because I never know when God may be around the next bend. I never know what life's going to throw me at the next corner. I never know what's going to happen. But if I have his grace and his love, I can react and do what he's called me to do because it's a way that I just consistently do who God has called me to do. That's
that's why I think uni is such a great way to, to what a better discipline than to say, God, I want to be broken and poured out. I want to remind myself of who I am to be, not just today and not just tomorrow, but every day of my life. And I, I don't just want to be this way on Sunday morning at 1030. I want to be this way every single day. And and, and, and if I don't have things in my life that are helping me and, and pushing me and, 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 and me striving to, to, to have that time and, and be victorious in my life all the time, that doesn't mean that, that there aren't moments where we, we, we doubt and there aren't moments that we question and there aren't moments where we aren't our best. But it means that I can faithfully have things that continue to push me and guide me and direct me like never before. Um, John Wesley called those um, the means of grace. Ways that God's grace is dispensed and speaks. And for John Wesley, communion is one of those ways that God speaks and God shapes and God forms you.